This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Thanks for joining me. I've got a killer conversation with Steve Zetro Souza from Exodus to share with you. Now, the catalyst of the chat is the same as the catalyst for the conversation with Gary Holt, and that being Exodus's new album, which shall see light of day on November 19, 2021. It is titled Persona Non Grata. Now, this conversation with Steve is a study in contrast compared to the chat with Gary. And the reason for that is because Steve was a little bit over having to answer all of the indie journalist's questions. I love Nuclear Blast, it must be said. I reckon it's the best metal label around these days. But they do put their artists on a bit of an interview treadmill. And as you can imagine, if you're doing if you're doing this sort of presser thing, what do you call it? Just indie journalist treadmill, phonogrind. There you go. I'm looking for the word, phonogrind. If you're doing this thing for weeks on end and you're speaking to hundreds of people throughout that period, the same bloody questions must come up again and again. So I asked Steve the question and you'll hear his response in the introduction. I think it's one of the best interviews or conversations that I've I've conducted because we're able to get to the bottom of some things and that's what I always try to do throughout my chat. So yes, of course, we cover the catalyst the new album, Persona Non Grata, but this conversation is far more notable because Steve shares his thoughts on a whole range of subjects and they're all related to Exodus and a little bit of politics too. Long-time listeners will know I tend to go there on that topic. My view ultimately is that metal and politics do mix. So here he is, Steve Zetro Souza from Exodus. Andrew McKay-Smith uh, from Australia calling from our, for our chat. How are you going? How are you doing? I'm good. Fine. Mate, you've been on this uh, this interview promotional trail now for weeks on end, so how are you holding up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's punishing, uh, isn't it? Yeah. It's punishing. It's like six or seven a day. You know, it's like, ah. Uh, I guess uh, you wanted to be a rock star. You, why, you, your mom said go to school and you said, fuck that. I want to <laughs> be this. Oh, be careful what you wish for sometimes. So. Oh, Jesus. No problem. It's all good. It's all good. I, I know it. I, I, I understand the territory. I understand what it is and what it entails. So, it's all good, brother. I bet, yeah. I, I'm going to open with a question that I I don't think you would have been asked yet. Okay, so I'm going to try and make this chat as interesting as possible for you, but what's the stupidest question you've been asked so far? Uh, the stupidest, I can tell when they, and it's, and it's a lot of people. It's, hmm. um, so, Petro, talk about the recording process. Oh, that is like, is that, that, that is the lamest, that means I'm not prepared, okay, and I don't know what to say. Oh, I see I've got an interview today. Oh, yeah, I'm an interviewer. Yeah, I, so talk about the song titles. It's like from that into that. It's like, oh, my God, how much more of this do I have to endure because you just fucking <laughs> didn't do your homework? You know what I mean? At least we've been around so long, it's like I don't feel that I have to do every little tiny interview, even though maybe the label does, you know what I mean? But Mm. I'm like, you know, let's get the credible ones. Let's get the ones that are interesting. I mean, that was actually an interesting question. Most interesting question I've had in two weeks. Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I do try. I do try for you. There you go. Good. uh, That's all I want is effort. I'll give you effort if you give me effort. And some of these people want to stay on for a full 30 minutes and have nothing to say. And if Uh, I know that they start out with like, Steve, you've been a, I've been a big influence. I've been listening to Exodus. This is an honor. I'm a, I like gulp. I'm like, oh, God, here it comes. So okay. it's more fanboy questions than really actually finding out, you know, what we're doing, what the mentality of the band and what's going on. So uh, yeah. it is what it is. That's what yeah, I get no. for being the singer. I could have been the drummer or the bass player where nobody really wants to talk to those guys. But No. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a heavy cross to it's a heavy cross and and a burden, isn't it? I mean, I've been doing this, having these conversations now for about four and a half years or so, and uh, I re- I've got to say, uh, Steve, I rarely ask that question, but I it's something rare for me that I did in preparation for our chat is I listened to a bunch of the interviews that you've done over the past few weeks that have been posted to YouTube and on podcasts and even read them. Yeah, and I noticed you were being asked virtually the same questions consistently. And either people... I I, I want to call the list and say, can we just do a press conference where you can put 20 people on a fucking Zoom call so that that, those 10 lame questions are answered right out of the gate? You know, it's like... (laughs) Yeah, I bet, I bet. But I, I, just talking about the album, is there any question that you wish had been asked that hasn't been asked about it? No, because you got to think about it. This is the 11th record. I mean, we've talked about the songs. We've talked about the mentality of the band. We've talked about what we did. I mean, everybody knows we took seven years to write a record. Why do you think that is? Well, because Gary Holt played in Slayer in our car, um, schedules never intervened ever, you know? And it was like, mm. if you wanted a record as good as Persona Non Grata is, we needed everybody's full attention, you know what I mean? So I don't think it would have been achieved at, at, at that kind of thing, you know what I mean? So it's pretty straightforward, I, I think, you know, the, the lyrical, especially the stuff that's been released the lyrical content is obviously we're very in touch with what's going on today, you know what I mean, what's going on. Not some fucking old men just trying to write, you know, grab a gun, shoot, kill, kill, evil, 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 uh, metal, bang, black, you, you know what I mean? You mm. can write all those words over for again and have a heavy metal song, you know what I mean? So, yeah, uh, I, don't, I, I don't, I think we're still, we're still hungry, you know what I mean? We still enjoy it, we still figure what could we fucking do next? You know what I mean, basically, is the mentality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a vibrant album, just talking about you know, the execution of the album. So clearly you guys, you got, for starters, you're getting along. It sounds like you're getting along well based on the cohesiveness of the album, but you still want to do this, and that isn't always the case. Well, it isn't because a lot of cases, and I mean, I'm in the business, so I know those who are and those who aren't. Hmm. And there's guys that go because, well, it's a paycheck and I can fucking go. But I don't think if you listen to this record that you get that from any means from top to bottom. I mean, it wasn't like, yeah, fuck, it's a great record. That's like four killer songs on it. It's like, no, there's a fucking 12 killer songs on this record. You know what I mean? There's fucking all hmm. of them kick ass. We don't write songs. We don't write extra songs where we go... Yeah, that one just didn't make the record. We don't approach it like that. Every song's got to be right there and in the pocket. So I think that the, the, honestly, the, this album's hills and valleys and hooks is like every song's got a vocal hook or a guitar hook or a change in it that just grabs you. So I, I just, I, I think, you know, it, it was a well composed record to give Gary Holt. Who wrote, you know, probably well ninety percent of it at least, or better? Uh, mm. Who are well composed. Out. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to try and make this chat as interesting as possible for you, and um, I'm going to go back in the past, if that's okay, um, and ask you a okay. question. I'm pretty sure. Again, I'm trying to think of questions that you haven't been asked before. I certainly have never personally heard you answer these questions so here i go what was it like working with chris sangaridis on force of habit oh for us it was a dream because if you think about the stuff that he had done in the past i mean he worked with judas priest and then finn lizzie you know Aussie too yeah yeah. And, uh, yeah for us it was like you know here's a guy who was a real he's passed since then i i you know but, yeah uh, a couple of years ago I, yeah. it's funny when yeah, when I first joined Exodus again in 2014, we played Bang Your Head Festival, and he was there with uh, uh, his band, actually. They were playing there. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were t- he had just produced a new UFO record, 
And I remember what we paid him to do that album. And this was in the day where fucking record producers for a six week fucking project, you mm. know, made, you know, 10,000 a week. You know what I mean? That kind yeah. of shit, you know? And then it, you know, obviously everybody and their mother got into it. So it wasn't as, as, you know, everybody could do it themselves after Pro Tools and all that stuff came in. So, I haven't asked him. I said, wow, price isn't as much anymore. He's on. no, no, no. I <laughs> wish it was back in those days. And then I heard a couple of years like I, that he had passed. So it's unfortunate. Great guy, though. Cool, yeah. I love Force of Habit, by the way. Um, I, potentially my favorite album from you guys. Uh, do you think that was an important album? A lot of al- people say that. I, mm. I hate that. There's songs. I, I've never hated any song on an Exodus record, but that album I there are songs that I just hate I mean I hate cringe when I hear but there are songs on that record that I mean I love Thorn in My Side I love One Foot in the Grave I love Me Myself and I I love Architect of Pain I mm. love the title track you know there are great songs on there but then there's songs on there which I'm not going to spoil it for you but I'm just going to ugh ugh <laughs> Do you think that was an important album for the band, given that grunge had broken just, I think, that year or six months prior? We were scared. That's what I think. What I think it was was the industry was changing. And the way that I explain it metaphorically is we were on a slip and slide trying to go uphill. And as soon as you gripped maybe a third of the way up, you slipped right back to the bottom again. And mm. nobody was paying attention. I mean, within a six-month period, fucking, um, um, what the fuck did they call it? They took headbangers off, fall off, and called it something else, uh, um, real rock or something rock. And it had mm-hmm. metal videos, but it also had alternative videos and rap metal videos. And it was just like, oh, this shit is over with. But I mean, does that have to do with the saturation of the scene and i mean not just being by thrash metal but hair metal think about it i mean every band from white snake to poison to sleaze bees and pretty boy i mean it was just a slaughter and winger and yeah there was so much fucking over kill of that but i think that saturated it and you know it just kind of affected everybody that's basically why we kind of called it quits. We saw the writing on the wall. Hmm. We couldn't get a game of jack back then. Nobody cared. By 93, nobody gave a shit. And then all of a sudden, by 2002, they gave a shit again. Yeah, it was. It was that entire decade, wasn't it? I mean, you were there for it, clearly, but I was growing up through that no, period. There was a time when I actually said to my ex-wife at the time, I'm off, I wonder if the kids are ever going to know the magnitude of what the old man did. And, I mean, because it was so, I mean, I remember bands, the only ones that kept going was a testament. They played little places hmm. to 120 people. And Slayer would play like the Trocadero in San Francisco holds like 300, you know what I mean? It would be packed for them anyway, but still, it wasn't like the last tour they're playing fucking 20,000 arenas, you know what I mean? It's just, it was a different thing. I think all the people that liked or listen, our era of people like went and had families and got their jobs and apprentices in school. And then they grew up and had families and like, wait a minute, what happened to my music? Well, yeah. you know, here it is again. So now the, the, the shows are better than they've ever been, you know, uh, uh, ticket sales wise. I mean, they're fucking people, are, they're, they come in droves now. Yeah, I think what happened was as soon as mainstream media through those stupid magazines, those mainstream magazines like Rolling Stone and stuff, couldn't determine and dictate to fans what our listening habits were because the internet kicked in and us fans could go, hey, what happened to Exodus? So we can go and, I mean, Napster was a Napster was a good and a very, very good and a very bad thing in a lot of ways, wasn't it? Because it opened up the fact that all of a sudden you weren't constrained by, by, not having money, for example, and you could download all your favorite albums, and that forced a resurgence of interest, I think, in bands like Exodus. That's that's my perspective, anyway. Well, I had no brand. Again, from a band like us, 
that I had to go work at a fucking job, you know what I mean? For 20 years, I was a cold carpenter. Mm. Uh, I, I find it. And I mean, it's a double-edged sword if you look at it. Yeah, you're not getting paid for it, but it's reissued um, interest in you. Mm. And uh, people that may have not been exposed to it and wouldn't necessarily go buy it can now download it and listen to it and go, oh, I like that. So we gained a bunch of fans from that, I think. Great. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you opened, people don't realize this, but you opened for the Chili Peppers on the tour for Impact is Imminent. So do you remember much about that tour? Um, it wasn't a tour. It was a one-off gig at the Oakland Auditorium. Ah, they were okay. on tour for Mother's Milk. They were on tour for Mother's Milk. And we, uh, and actually it was, Urban Dance Squad, Exodus, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh, God. Remember Urban Dance Squad? Yeah. Different shade of soul. You know, I mean, you talk about who the fuck would book this, but I mean, we were fr- The Chili Peppers actually requested us from what we, are, we were told. So, mm. And we were both kind of on the same label. We were on Capitol at the time. Yep. So, yeah. it allowed us to do a few things. Yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah, and hey, what was your what was your thoughts on the the album cover? The artwork for Impact is imminent. Um, that was a um, that was a, a painting actually. That's not even a photo. That was a photo that we t- we took a photo in the back of a car. Yeah, but the specialty about that album cover, the person that did it, and we're talking. This is now. 31 fucking years ago, okay? Mm. Um, their specialty was to make paintings look like photos. And that's, so that is all a painting. I love that album cover. Although, I was tired of being on the album covers after a while. Fuck for the laugh. For three in a row, we were on the album cover. It was like Pleasures, Fabulous, and Impact. Mm. And then Force Ab, I'm sorry, we had Ralph Steadman do that artwork. Paid him thirty grand to do that. Whatever that thing is, looks <laughs> like a bird. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Ruin our logo. Ugh. Yeah. Well, we didn't know. We like I said, we scraping. We were we 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 were slip. We were on a slip and slide, <laughs> trying to go uphill. It wasn't every time where we slide down. We yeah. Saw the writing on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. With um. With force of habit, there's an artist in Australia. He's he's long gone now, but he's quite famous. But he does artwork that looks very similar to what you've got on Force of Habit, and his name is Pro Heart. And um, I always remember as a kid thinking, "Wow, Pro Heart must have done the Exodus album cover." How did you guys get an Australian you to know, do it for you? <laughs> I don't know if it was. I thought it was a chick that did it out of L.A. And it probably uh, she was. Had yeah, these ones were like. Oh God! Like um, it looked like a picture, and this girl was in a room, and the top of it was like like the top of the ocean, and it was like, what is? Again, thirty. Now we look at it and go, ah, some fucking ten year old kid can do that on his computer in five <laughs> seconds. But thirty one years ago, it wasn't like that, you know. So that was hmm. that was the effect. That was Capital's idea. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, well, the major labels always had the good ideas, didn't they? Well, they had the resources. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm being facetious, by the way. Uh, I'm being, um, yeah, I know. They, uh, w- when you're on the major yeah, labels... Yeah, being- they had the resources, but they didn't know what to do with you. For two records, they, we, uh, the death of us was going there, period. Yeah. That was the death of us. That was the allure, though. Oh, we're on a major label now. We're going to be rock stars and rich, and it's all good. Capital will make us sell platinum records and buy a house in the hill, marry a rich, famous actress. It's all good. Here it comes. And then they just they didn't know what thrash metal was. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what to do with what they were doing. And it's like, oh, yeah, how much money do we have dumped in these guys? What? How much? I mean, they, were, they probably had sticker shock. That's why after two records they said, Later. Yeah. Well, they didn't treat you guys that well either from the perspective that um, when the Judas Priest tour was booked in support of Painkiller. Oh, yeah. Exactly. We believe me. We live that down to this day. 
51 hmm. shows supporting Priest on Painkiller would have done so much for us. But no, go home and write a record. Go home and write a record we can market, is what they were saying. So we demoed everything on Force of Habit so they could listen to it and go, yes, this is the right direction. And we were like, ah, uh, okay. Okay, we better do this because the label, fuck, man, if we don't, we're going to be fucked. And da, 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 you know what I mean? Hmm. So instead of following our instincts, we followed that. Then by the time Temple of the Dam comes around, we're fucking broke. Whatever happened to us, happened to us. And, and you can't take that back. So go listen to that record. Go listen to two. You'll hear a, a fucking pissed off group of broke motherfuckers that put a record together. That's why Tempo is so, oh, people widely consider that the best comeback album ever. Because mm. it's just raw. It's what Exodus was about. We didn't know nobody. In fact, we recorded the record with no deal. We got the deal with Nuclear Blast after the fact. Yep. Yeah. Hey, just talking about that, that painkiller tour. Because you couldn't go on it, I think that's, I mean, that, that tour, there's no question it broke Pantera. Do you ever think about that? And Annihilator was on that tour, too. Pissed me off. I fucking pissed and moaned that we had Bill Graham management at that time, which was actually major management. And they fucking, uh, they, he had his hands tied. He couldn't do anything about it. I was pissed. I mm. was not happy. Out that, believe me. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's one of those sliding doors moments in a way, isn't it? I mean, think about it. We're twenty. I'm twenty six years old, and your heroes want to take you out on the road, and your fucking record label says, "Ah, uh, no." Yeah, assholes. Yeah, it was fun. yeah. So yeah, that was no good for us. Yeah. Hey, uh, John Tempesta, long admired his drumming chops. I th- thought he was a fam- magnificent drummer for you guys. Um, wh- what special qualities do you think he brought to the group? Uh, attention to detail and his attentiveness because he came into the band at a time where the other four of us were fucking loose cannons and they needed that structure because where we were, like I said, 25, 26-year-old kids. Anything mm. you could put in a, in a glass... On a mirror, in a rolling paper, and in a pussy, we were fucking there. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Just the way it was. But when Johnny came in, Johnny was like, whoa, this dude's always on time, and whoa, he's always neat, and uh, he's got his shit together, and his drum chops are together, and he practices. It was like, none of us do that, you know what I mean? So <laughs> we was like Charlie Benante's tech. We were good friends with Charlie. We took his uh, advice on it. But look at Johnny. Johnny is his own man. Got his own, had his own drum for Tama for years. Sells, does really well. Fucking um, played in White Zombie. Played with Rob Zombie, and now he's with the Cult. You know, what I mean? you know? Mm-hmm. talk about a resume. Yeah, magnificent drummer. Un- underappreciated is the word that comes to mind. He just played with us. We, uh, Tom, our, our drummer was sick. Um, he mm-hmm. was battling his affliction. We had to play a concert in um, August and then in September. Psycho Vegas and uh, um, Full Terror Assault in Illinois. And uh, he, John, because Tom wasn't able to do it, John played those shows. He did indeed. A reunion. Yeah. yeah. 30 years later. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Hey, um, I've only got probably one time for one more question. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, I don't think that there's there should be any question that your support for Trump was well placed, given the shit show that you have as a president these days. <laughs> Can I ask a very broad question? What are your thoughts about what the hell's happening in the states at the moment? Um, all I can say is we told you so. We yeah. told you so. The problem with them was is that nobody like nobody they disliked the person. He didn't like this, like, and, and, and because he, what other leader in the world through history, if you tweet, would come right back at you and go, hey, fuck you, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. he was a politician. He's already a millionaire and a very famous man, more famous than any of the presidents. You know what I mean? So what did he have to gain? You know what gas? Gas has gone up a full dollar since he's gone out of, out of, uh, 
wood prices used to be $28 for a sheet of plywood. It's $94 for a sheet of plywood now. So you tell me. You tell me what's going on. That's why. So everybody good. I'm glad. And I feel that nobody's really doing anything right now. I have not seen our government do anything. They're just sitting back like they always do and just cruise. I thought Obama did the same thing. He just got in office and, yeah, I'm the president. What are you doing today? I'm just being the president. You know, something comes up, I'll get with it. But I don't see him getting out there. Fucking Trump, you heard his goddamn name every, every day, whether you liked it or not. He was mm. trying to close up the borders and build a wall. All people didn't like that. Do you know when I go to Australia or Mexico, I have to fucking get a visa to come into your countries. Why doesn't anybody have to have a visa to come into my country? That's bullshit. And that's all he was trying to do. You know what I mean? But people think, no, he's a racist and he doesn't like Latin people. And man, I, I was just like, you know, again, I, I voted through my life. I'm 57 years old and I voted Democrat many, many times. I vote mm. for who the guy I think could do it. And uh, over the last 10 years, I completely went right wing. And I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, I, I have ideals. I mean, they're forcing you to get a vaccine or do, do we live in a socialist society or I, what happened to my body, my choice? Mm. You know what I mean? I don't understand it. And it's not about the vaccine not being effective or whatever. It's about the choice that you're telling me to. Like Absolutely. we're playing a concert with Testament and Death Angel in Oakland, California next month. You have to show proof of vaccination to even come in. I think that's socialist right there. That's bullshit. What about AIDS, people that AIDS? What if people have um, you know, hep C? How come they don't have to show? What about people, you know, I, mean, I don't know. I'm just like, to me, it's just like, like anything else. Why is this all of a sudden in the government mandate here? So that's what I think, especially where persona non grata comes from. There's a lot of social socialist content on here, you know what I mean? And, uh, God, so hmm. speaks up for us. Yep, indeed. The the rise of identity politics and the totalitarian left, mate. It's it's really bad here in Australia, as, you, as you've probably seen with some news reports with the I lockdowns. Have. It's revolting. Yeah, I never I never thought we'd get Why to this point. You're ruining, but we never did either. We were all big fans of Australia. We we're like, oh my god, them in New Zealand, that they have for years go to Australia. They got it going on, and then all of a sudden this thing came down, and you guys were like, fuck, what the fuck? What are you doing over there? It's, I mean, yes, it's real. Yes, it kills people. It's no worse than the flu, though. You know what I mean? You just got to fucking... You can't shut the world down. You can't ruin people's businesses that hmm. they built. What a little mom pot donut shop that rely on them. How were they supposed to survive? You know what I mean? It's like, whatever. I'm just using that as an example. It's like, hmm. you cannot... My take is you cannot run from something. You need to hit it head on. And once you hit it head on, you're going you're gonna to beat it. You're going to beat it. Mm-hmm. Agreed, mate. From it, like they're doing all the time. Let's keep locking it down. Let's not do it anymore. Let's keep the festivals till next year, and then till next year, and then the next year. Just do it. What are you going to do? You know, hide from this thing for your whole life? It's been two years now. Two years. It's fucking November. The shit hit in fucking December 19. I know because I was in Europe when it went down. Mm. I had to fly home in the beginning of March, heading too far away, two years. Get it together, people. I just don't think our governments or our officials that are the heads of the world right now really know what they're doing or know what to do with this. I wish they would just say they don't instead of trying to act like they do. Yeah, I think and I I think the opposite. To be honest with you, I think they know exactly what they're doing, and it's all about totalitarianism and power and controlling well, populations. That's, true too. that's you know. another that that control. There's another. That's another theory. You know what I mean? And it's just another way to try to control us until much another strain comes out in another year because it'll be in that much more controlling. They they seen it worked. You know yep. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of bias towards it all. You know what I mean? But I'm. We'll see. Yeah. We Mate, I could talk about this for hours. Yeah, yeah, but... Um, yeah, I don't believe me. I, and I got another guy coming in in two minutes, so yeah. I will let you go, my friend. Good chat. You actually were... You're actually up there with the with the best uh, interviews. You should be proud, because over the last three weeks, I swear to God, I called manager yesterday and go, I'm going to hang myself if this continues. <laughs> <laughs> Normal interviews.
Well, that's high praise coming from you, Have Zed. Day, mate. Thank you, brother. <laughs> no worries. You soon. Take care. So there you have it, my chat with Steve Zetro Souza from Exodus. I think after that one, I'm inspired to start collecting some of my favoured conversations from over the years and put them together in a series called Classic Conversations, because that's exactly what that one there was. What a fella. I enjoyed that one immensely. Do check out that new Exodus album too. It's an absolute ball terror. Persona non grata, one of the albums of the year. It's out November 19. Buy it for your boyfriend or girlfriend for Christmas, especially if they don't like metal. There you go. Um, What else have I got to share with you? Not much. I better do the closing remarks. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith. I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. If you like what you heard, go across to scarsandguitars.com where you'll have access to many more conversations just like that one. I am posting some legacy conversations so chats that I've had in years gone by because that website is relatively new and only a fraction only a sample of the conversations that I've had to date are available there but go across to Wushka W-H-O-O-S-H-K-A-A if you are interested in obtaining a list and access to all of the conversations that I've had over the past four and a half years or so. They are all over there. Just type in scarsandguitars.com. No, not scarsandguitars.com. Scars and Guitars Wooshka. Just Google it and you'll bring it up. You know what I'm trying to say. If you could like, subscribe and share, that'd be awesome too. That all helps. But even better, please leave a nice comment. I'd appreciate it. I try to get back to everybody who comments on socials and on YouTube. So I guess that's it. Until next time, it's a very good bye for now.